And so the first place I always start to tell people is really take a look at what you think is essential and make sure in this moment you have 24 months of cash. Breathe. There will be life on the other side. Don't make harsh decisions. Have plenty of cash to last it out. You got to pick yourself up, go backwards and slam yourself at the wall like 500 more times until the wall crumbles. 25% of middle school girls already believe they'll never achieve their dream career. Dream career. career. Hi, I'm Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint. Hint. And you're Hint. listening to Unstoppable, a podcast spotlighting the journeys of inspiring entrepreneurs. I believe that at its core, leadership is about constantly learning from the people around you. And I'm so inspired by the conversations we're having in our upcoming episodes and can't wait to share them with you. This season, some of my guests include Rebecca Minkoff, fashion designer and founder of the Female Founder Collective, Diana Kaff, author of Girls Who Run the World, Andrew Dudham, founder of Hymns, and Eugene Rem, co-founder of Rumble Fitness, and much, much more. Plus, we ask the million dollar question, what does it really take to be unstoppable? Unstoppable. Let's find out. Hi everybody, it's Kara Golden from Unstoppable and I'm super excited to have our next guest here, Amy Arrett. Hello, Amy, how are you? Hi, Kara. Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing well, thanks. So Amy is the founder and CEO of an amazing, amazing company based also in San Francisco, like Hint is, Madison Reed. And we are actually recording this, both of us having been not together, but but in the Bay Area in our shelter in place mode. And I've been wanting to do this for a while with Amy. And so we decided let's get on Zoom and and do this. And I'm very, very excited to hear how this time has been for Madison Reed. So Amy, just a little bit of information on Amy, really multifaceted career has ranged from not only founding and operating companies, and obviously the founder and CEO of Madison Reed, which is an omni-channel beauty brand that is disrupting really the hair care, hair color space. She's also a partner at True Ventures, focusing on investments in consumer and e-commerce startups. And she's been named one of the Bay Area's most influential women in business by the San Francisco Business Times. Today, we're going to talk about what she's learned in this industry, but just overall as a disruptor. And, And I always say that I think every one of my guests, it's not just about being an entrepreneur, but it's also about just being just a great, kind person who is also, you know, really trying to do things a little bit differently. So huge admiration for you, Amy. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. So let's start with, so you disrupted the $15 billion hair coloring industry with Madison Reed. Can you tell us what's inspired you to start this company? Yeah. Uh, so again, thank you for having me. I had, I have massive admiration back at you. Oh. So I just want to say that and i um, you know, always excited when badass women get to be together. So, you know, exciting to thank be here. You. You're welcome. Yeah. So, you know, I saw much like you did in Hint, I think there's some parallels to our story. You saw something that was personal to you that wasn't working and you just went ahead and disrupted it. And for me, it was somewhat similar to that, which is, you know, I was so interested in my friends telling me about how often they had to get their hair color and how they were increasingly concerned about what was in the hair color and how going to a salon took a lot of money and time and then the box on the shelf was terrible and highly toxic. And in fact, the instructions in the box, the first thing it says on the instructions, open a window before you start. So I thought, I thought, you know, geez, somebody could do better than this. I happened to be a VC at the time. And so I had been funding companies that were disrupting large categories in personal care and direct to consumer. And I just started to literally, I did a screen of how big hair color was. Just it came to my mind because I passed on Dollar Shave Club, which is, you know, always every great investor has the wall of shame, as I call it, you know, the ones that got away. And this was one that got away. My partner and I couldn't kind of see eye to eye about that. And I was just kept thinking about what Mike was doing at Dollar Shave. And I said, there must be a women's analog of a 
kind of online disruptor in a category that nobody is paying attention to that's massive and has repetitive use. Mm -hmm. Because much like drinking water, you know, coloring your hair is one of those things that, and boy, have we learned that during the pandemic, that that, that stack ranks above a lot of other things for women. And so I just, you know, decided to look at the size of the prize. As you said, it was $15 billion. The option, there were no options. There was no com competition in the market. And so initially I thought maybe I would fund somebody to do it. And then as I just got deeper and deeper into it, I just realized it was a massive opportunity. And then, you know, I have the good fortune. Uh, it's named after my daughter. And that, you know, is special because it really, uh, the brand is really about empowerment. And the brand is about, you know, kind of uh, showing women that they can take back their beauty. We don't retouch any of our models, right? So we don't Photoshop our models. Our models are primarily all of our customers. You know, it's what real women look like, mm -hmm. you know, versus what the media tries to tell us that women should look like. And so it's a, it's a metaphor for that. That's awesome. So it's rare that a venture capitalist actually goes in this direction. And what, yeah. what was it that made you kind of have that itch? I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, you mentioned Dollar Shave and sort of seeing some of these, but why don't you think more venture capitalists jump into actually operating and, and founding companies? Oh, well, can I, I how flippant should I be? <laughs> uh, Honest Amy over here. Because you have to work really hard. Yeah. So, you know, I had been a three-time entrepreneur before I became a VC. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't know that, that I had an operating career before. And I really, the truth was I kind of, you know, fell into being an investor. It wasn't sort of a lifelong passion and I loved it. And I ran Maveron's office in the Bay Area where it never existed, Seattle-based firm. Howard Schultz was my partner. And it was awesome. I did it for six and a half years, but I actually really at the same time had a longing to get back in this crazy thing that we do, you know, which is creating something from nothing, you know, building teams, doing something that we believe has purpose and mission and accomplishing that. And so I had that itch going on at the same time that I came up with this idea and then told Maveron that I was going to go do this crazy thing. That's awesome. And how many years now? When did you start? Six. Six years. And so, yeah, I remember when I first started telling at the conference that you and I met at that first year that I was going to go do something like this. And all of my venture friends were at the conference were like texting me later, like, I think it's a really bad idea. I don't know why you would be doing this. This is who cares about hair color? Like, I, are you having like a midlife crisis? What is going like everyone was quite concerned that. I was going to do something because, you know, I mean, come on, Kara, being a venture capitalist is the pinnacle of. Right. Yeah. And going, so, that's anyway. funny. Have you had conversations with them since? Only when they've asked if they could invest. Yeah. <laughs> Later on in my response has been, nah, I don't think so right now. And, you know, we've been friends. Many of them became angels early on. And so I'm just, I'm sort of poking fun. At I was going to say, it's funny. It reminds me. So yesterday was our 15th birthday. Wow. And so Congratulations. I got our first bottle of Hint on the shelf at Whole Foods in San Francisco on California and Franklin Street. And then I went and had my fourth child at California <laughs> at two o'clock in the afternoon. Hopefully not in the same 15 no, minutes. No, but I had <laughs> to get this done. This was like on my to-do list real quick. I got to get the product on the shelf. And then I'm going to get this kid out of me. Yeah, and I said, <laughs> Congratulations. I said to the guy at Whole Foods, I was like, by the way, I, I won't be available for the rest of the day, but I'll be, you can call me tomorrow and tell me. How I'll be back online. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we sold out of the product, but it was funny because I ended up talking to a venture capitalist who's never invested in Hint. And he just was calling me yesterday just to catch up. And I told him it was our 15th birthday and he had seen me. He was thinking about how he had actually met me in a, in a store stocking the shelves. And he yeah. told me that it was a really bad idea. That hint was a <laughs> terrible idea. And he, so yesterday was the moment where he said, you know, this is one of those where I look at and I think, wow, like I thought this was a really bad idea. And now I would say, you know, I'm kicking myself. And also, yeah, totally. Yeah. Looking at you and, and the people that you have behind you and, you know, people who invested early on, I always tell people, you got to have a great product, but you also have to be the person that people are going to march behind. Right. And, and I think totally. that's what I see in you as well, that it's, 
you've done an amazing job of building this and not only building, like I said, you got to have a great product, but also culture. I hear from people all the time that work with you and, and have worked with you and, you know, they're just like, Amy is amazing and she's just a great leader. And so anyway, it's always, it's always nice to hear that, right? Especially when you're like yeah. living and breathing it every single day and you don't necessarily hear it. When the bubble in your head is don't melt down, don't melt down. Yeah. <laughs> but I appreciate you saying it. I feel the same exact way about you. And, you know, I think in general, women go at these things in a slightly different way. Right. And so, you know, I'm happy for hint success. You deserve it. I love it. So you talked a little bit about this, but diving into sort of the chemicals and, and Madison Reed's products have the lowest chemical profile that exists in the market today. And yeah. mm -hmm. that's amazing. Uh, can you take us through the process? You know, you had this idea, right? And how yeah. did you go mm -hmm. from this idea to, you know, ultimately figuring it out? Did you go to your local CVS and start, you know, pulling products and reading, you know, the ingredients or what was sort of like the, the big epiphany that you, you know, had to sort of say, I'm going to go and figure this out. So, you know, I, yes, I was in Whole Foods at the time, speaking of Whole Foods, I wasn't pregnant and I had a list from my wife, Claire, about what to get in Whole Foods. She's very specific. She's a chef. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the list that one gets from a professional chef to go into Whole Foods. And I get a text in the middle of me being at the meat department. I'll never forget it. And it says, could you buy me some hair color? And I'm like, okay, where? <laughs> and she said, oh, Whole Foods, you know, that's probably has better for you stuff. So just, you know, I said, well, where is it? She said, I don't know, maybe where like the body soap is and stuff like that, the shampoo. Yeah. So I went into that section in Whole Foods and they're down at the bottom were these like, boxes that had like dust on them and like you'd you know and I looked and I said well what color and she said oh the you know black or the darkest brown they have and I said you know you know with all due respect I know who colors your hair now and it's like 300 bucks a pop she had gone completely gray in her 20s which is very dark hair so when you're in that state you're coloring your hair all the time she said you know I'm just worried about what's in the hair color and so if I think if I buy it at Whole Foods maybe it's better well, I bought, you know, a couple of boxes of the darkest brown that I could find. And the next tour on Saturday morning was Walgreens. And I can't make this up. It's like, I'm sure you have had these synchronistic moments in your life. Like for no apparent reason, these things, you connect dots later yeah. on. And I happened to be walking down the dreaded hair color aisle on my way to pick up prescriptions. And I just look up and it's like, you know, it looked like a thousand boxes of terrible stuff that all had little yellow stickers of, you know, on sale for $7.99. I randomly bought 60. Interesting. And I just like put them in the cart and then I go and they're like, what are you doing? And I, then I went home, opened them all up and it was just startling to me. You know, the nothing's recyclable, open a window before you start, horrible component tree. The gloves are these big Frankenstein gloves that are slippery. Only one pair, which you'd have to put back on in the shower after you use them. Terrible. Like everything was just bad. And this epiphany to me just came over me, which was the following. This is supposed to make you beautiful, but I'm going to torture you along the way. And it just was this like consumer discourse in my mind. And so I went on a quest, it sounds bizarre. And the quest took me to find people that knew how to make hair color and they took me to Italy. And then from there, the rest was sort of like, oh geez, we can find people who would believe in the story and we could take these awful things out. And so we have this eight free formula that nobody else has, no ammonia, no PPD, no phthalates, no resourceful, no gluten. People ask me all the time, well, why would gluten matter if you have a celiac problem? and you put gluten in any of your products on your external body, you're going to break out in allergic hives. Right? That's, a, that's so and, interesting. And, and, Frank, and 20 some percent of women have some allergic reaction to hair color, classic hair color. Hmm. And what in salons, they put sweet and low in your hair color to stop you from having the reaction. I definitely couldn't have that. So I, I, I don't yeah. like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but you have it on your head. So I found these folks, I tell a funny story that I met 13 manufacturers in Italy 
the first 11 thought I had lost my mind. Mm -hmm. It was like an old Italian guys, like sell hair color, technology color matching online. What, don't you have a salon? And they just couldn't, and you want to take this stuff? One guy looked at me and said, it's just easier to leave it in, it works. And I said, no, you don't understand. And lucky number 12 is still the partner that we have today. We are their largest customer by far. And he listened and he listened. He, he, they, we've become very close personal friends. And he looked at me and he said, I don't know why I'm going to say yes to this. He said, but there's two conditions. You have to pay me all up front, 100% and all in euro. Ah. And I paused and I don't know why. I said, okay. I didn't have the money raised. I, <laughs> I just said, okay. And then uh, he came to the Napa Valley last year and we talked, took him and his wife wine tasting. And we were sitting there having a glass of wine. It's hilarious. And he said in his broken English, you know, I was scared when you said, you know, when you came in, he said, but I was really scared when you agreed to those two ridiculous terms I put in front of you. And so, yeah, we made 19 shades initially. I brought back 15 tubes of, I think, 12 colors and convinced a very famous stylist in San Francisco, who's a good friend, who's been helpful, a guy by the name of Alex Chases. You know, he's kind of the high-end stylist. Mm -hmm. I convinced him on a Friday night to color 10 of my friend's hair with our product as sort of a Pass. focus group. Yeah. yeah. And nine of them went perfectly, except the one was my best friend from college, <laughs> who was freaking out and screaming at me, Amy meeting my husband in 45. You better fix my goddamn hair. Oh, so right in that moment, I saw the nine that were flipping their hair around and looking gorgeous in the joy. And I saw the agony. And I often tell that story, honestly, because what matters most in our business is getting her hair to be perfect. Mm -hmm. It's personal. And so I learned in that moment that the risk of screwing that up you know, the, the fact that we needed to have great technology to color match and we needed a call center with colorists, like the, as I call it, the belt and suspenders of Madison Reed. Yeah. It was all about that you only have one shot and it's personal. I think that's the biggest fear, right? For women that they just, I mean, they don't Completely. have time, right? So Completely. for the mess, right? Yeah. And it's really getting it right. And yeah. You can't, it's not like, um, you know, this isn't darts or horseshoes, as I tell my folks yeah. all the time. This isn't close enough is good, right? This is, she's, so we're this funny business, which is she comes to Madison Reed with all these dreams and aspirations and wants to be in the brand and loves the empowerment and the no retouching and she sees herself in it and the great ingredients. And then she gets to this moment where she has to push the buy button <laughs> and she's sitting there and she's thinking, you know, every woman has at least two or three bad hair stories, right? Like any woman that I've ever talked to, you know, I have a terrible, not hair story. I have a terrible eyebrow story where somebody dyed my eyebrows and you know, they look like they didn't go with the rest of my face. Yeah. Right. They were more like your hair color <laughs> in my eyebrows. Uh, and uh, that didn't go so well. But my point is, it's really interesting because we need to do a lot to get her over that fear. I could talk a little bit about the things we have done. I mean, that's sort of changed as there's been more efficacy. I know you're super focused on quality at Hint. And I just think, again, you know, a lot of uh, direct-to-consumer businesses can, and I don't mean this in a bad way, they can throw together a product and it kind of is good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, in your business, it either has the stuff in it or it doesn't, and it either tastes good or it doesn't. Yeah, and you have one yeah. bad experience and- And you're done. Yeah, and you're done. And, and for us, I've now really altered somebody's confidence. It's not just their appearance. Yep. Hair is confidence. Hair is like when your hair looks amazing, you feel incredible. When your hair doesn't look so good, you're like, let me put a cap on, let me, that's, you know, let me pull it back. And so I just think that it's one of those things where we're really dealing with the psychological safety and security. And I think we need to earn that every single day. So one thing that I saw you do a few years ago that I thought was brilliant was your partnership with Ulta and going yes. in there. And then I know you've gone since then into your own stores and which yeah. I think is incredible. So how did the relationship with Ulta come about? So, I, you know, again, I um, sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart. They came to us. And I think that what had happened was they started to see the resonance of the brand. They too, Alta is a very interesting partner. So they have 1,200 stores, a big Alta.com business. They started to really pay attention to clean 
and they started to pay attention to this category because believe it or not in every Alta, they have their own salon. Mm -hmm. So they started to be able to see that in the salon, you could never take, give somebody a box to take home. Right. And they also started to see that we had a strategy to um, sort of be a premium salon quality product that was accessible to consumers. I think they also probably looked at their numbers of turn of the other brands and they had a lot of other brands that were less expensive and what I think were not as good quality sitting on the shelf forever. That dust that I told you about in Whole Foods. And so I think they just looked at that and they're like, oh my God, hair color is massive. And I'll, you know, I will share this statistic with you. We've done as much business in Alta.com during the pandemic with all Alta stores closed than we did in any week in 1200 Alta stores. It's amazing. And it's because hair color It's not just a a nice to have, it's a must. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, so I think Alta saw that and they looked around and they're saying like, we're moving premium in color cosmetics. We're moving to premium in skincare with a cleaner ingredient. We don't have anything in hair color. And so they came to us. We were, my head of product is phenomenal. So she and I went to Chicago to talk to them and I walk into the room and I'm like, no, we don't go on anybody else's shelf. And they're like, we're we're Alta. (laughs) And I'm like, no, no, we're a direct-to-consumer brand. And she was the head merchant at Sephora before this. So she's literally kicking me under the table, like, shut up, founder. And, you know, we just started the conversation about why I founded the brand, what mattered. And they said, listen, let's just do this. Let's just do a test. I said, okay, well, how many stores is a test? And they're like, 450. And I'm like, 450 stores? Okay, we'll do it. Now she starts really kicking me under the table because she's like, you've lost your mind. Because remember, Kara, the difference was we were sending people a box, a cardboard eco box as a mailer. We had nothing that was shelf ready. Yeah. We had no packaging that was shelf ready. We had no planograms. We knew nothing about end caps, nothing, right? She knew about it. So I'm the D2C person. I'm like, yeah, no problem, 450. We get back in the rent a car and she's like, not only were you a jerk in the beginning, but <laughs> do you understand what it's going to take to get 450 stores up in four months? Yeah. And we did a lot. it. And yeah. And the sales were incredible. And then not uh, six months later, they asked us to go into every store and they told us that they've exited all other permanent hair color. So it's really just us in Alta. And that's been fantastic for us. They're an amazing partner, really. They're a partner. Yeah, we've had a great relationship, so it's been terrific. It's it's interesting. We I was talking to an entrepreneur the other day and telling him like when we first launched, we just really want a trial, right? Because we 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 were in stores, we didn't have direct to consumer when we started, and you know, so we we really put all of our marketing dollars that we had into just getting sampling, and that's how I view Ulta. Even it's like paid sampling. I mean, people are going in, and especially those people that didn't have trust to actually buy it online, they're going in and trying it, and it's the same stuff in Ulta that you're selling online, and it's the same stuff we put in your hair and the color bars. Right. So which so then the, the third leg of the stool that you alluded to was our own stores. And so Alta was second. We had done, I had convinced the board a couple of years ago to give us $75,000 to do a pop-up in New York City. I remember you I, were telling me yeah. you were doing that. And I said, and they're like, what? You're, you're a direct-to-consumer brand. And I said, no, you have to understand that 50% of the market doesn't want to do their hair themselves. Right. So we were always going to have a total addressable market problem. And so, you know, and I said, and I think, and this was, I just said, I've been studying the salon market. Here are the three things that I think it's ours if we can pull it off. One, it's a, there is no technology in the market. So anybody who puts an appointment online or has no CM, CRM, no data about customers, you go to a salon, salon now, Kara, I could tell you they, Kara walks in, she gets an appointment, she has a relationship, she walks out. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? There's no point of sale data. There's no understanding. They don't even, uh, there's an index card that your stylist probably has in the back. Hopefully. This is the formula. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully, right? So I said there was no technology, one. Two, that the price is way expensive compared to the real SLA of getting someone's hair color. So we could disrupt on price, we could disrupt on technology. And number three, there's never been a stylist that's going to give you the same color they put on your hair. 
So the consumer is effectively, you know, re the relationships with the stylist, the relationships not with the product. So I said, I think if we can disrupt that and just make it be so that she can do it at home if she wants, there's consistency. Imagine this, like imagine if you're in Las Vegas and your roots are showing, you can't get to your stylist, but you walk into a Madison Reed and it's the same color that you had put on in New York City at Madison Reed or that you happen to take a box home because you didn't have the time, it's the same exact consistency. And so I said, I think if we do those three things, we could actually blow up the entire salon industry. Yeah. And so we have 12 that we'll reopen with 20 in the next two weeks. You know, it's been an interesting path as our online business exploded, you know, having to close down the stores. So there's been the interesting sort of path of that. And they're just, they're temporarily closed, right? You're. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all temporary. And they're now Texas reopens and for retail only pickup. And that's been unbelievable. I've been shocked about people coming in and wanting to buy boxes out of our stores. That's a, about 200% up from what kind of retail we always sold a good amount of retail, but it's, tremendous such a crazy time so for sure i'd love to hear a little bit more about what do you see you know as entrepreneurs we have so many people as i mentioned before who are listening to this who are you know entrepreneurs but also you know thinking about being entrepreneurs we have investors etc you know and that may need to ultimately share some of these thinking to people they know or investments that they have. What do you think are like the key things for entrepreneurs to think about as we are moving out of shelter in place into reality? Yeah. I mean, what you've been through, yeah. you've been on the other, on the other side, on the uh, venture side, but, and, and are still on the venture side, but also you've run companies and you've seen yeah. like me, you've seen, you know, 2009, I saw cycles. these cycles yeah. along the way. I mean, what would you tell you know, people to really focus on. Yeah. So the first thing that I tell everybody is cash mm -hmm. is king. So the first place to start is as long as you have cash to live another day, you're good. And so the first place I always start to tell people is really take a look at what you think is essential and make sure in this moment you have 24 months of cash. That's what I really yep. believe. And it's not because we may need 24 months of cash, but we don't know. We're, you know, I think we're in a very different state than we are, we're, have ever been in, in my work life, right? And it's not that this isn't a cycle that's going to come back. It will come back. It's just that so many of the norms that we understand about being together and about physical space and about the, you know, how comfortable am I walking in physical four wall retail and all of those things, I mean, if you just look at China and what's happened post Wuhan and what's happened there, you know, mall traffic is not back up, right? Like there's just a lot of things that are going to take time. And so in the taking time, you need to have the cash to wait out and watch what's mm -hmm. happening. And you should be looking at, you know, as I say to everybody, every single business has at least 15% of stuff that you're doing that at the end of the day, if you weren't doing nothing yep. would change. It's just the way yeah. it is. And so as the going gets good, the filling, as I say, you give people a glass and the water goes right to the top. You give them a smaller glass <laughs> and the water goes to the top and nothing really changed between the productivity of the two glasses. And so I just think that this is a time to take a hard look. It's unpleasant. I mean, this is just honest, but I will share this with you. Like we're doing phenomenal and we're being hyper vigilant about every dollar. Because you, you cannot ever prepare for the things you don't know, right? And nobody knew, you know, so many of my friends have gone through hardship. They didn't deserve this. How could you blame somebody whose business model got, you know, screwed up because of COVID-19? I mean, what kind of insight could anybody have? So I think that cash is king. Number two, you know, again, I'm not the best person in the world to talk to about B2B or SaaS platform stuff, I kind of understand it, but it's not where I invest. I'm a consumer person, right? I think understanding who your customer is and what it is that this change has done in their mm -hmm. eyes is really critical. 
And so, you know, we're doing a ton of focus groups, right? And we, you know, we were six years in and we kind of knew our customer and, and then all of a sudden, literally, you know, so I'll, I'll share this with you. In the last 10 weeks, our business, I'm not making this, our business doubled in the last 10 weeks. So all of a sudden, there is a massive number of new customers that have come to us and they're not the same people that we're always, always mm-hmm. buying. And so all of a sudden, our mindset is not the same bag of tricks may not work, right? And so we're, you know, know the customer. I know this sounds bizarre, but time is your friend. And this just comes as, you know, as, as one gets more mature, I think that means old, Kara, in life. What you start realizing is that you're in a rush for a lot of things. And, you know, the lessons learned or the, what I call the pattern recognition is really your friend, right? Paying attention, being thoughtful, not rushing to, to really crazy decisions, you know, because here's the thing, there was no shelter in place. Then in one day there was massive shelter in place. And now 10 weeks later, everyone's like, is there shelter in place? I don't think there's shelter in place. Is it coming back? I'm not sure it's coming back, right? So you feel these waves of things and the way media exists in the world, they happen in like five minute increments. And so it's hard for us to sort out what's really true. And so what I keep telling our folks is time is our friend. In our color bars, good example, start at retail only, do it for four weeks. Let's see what happens. Is there demand? Oh, demand. Had did anybody get sick? Oh, no one got sick. You know, can we control the customer wearing a mask? Right? This is a big thing in our business. We're not reopening our color bars without our team members and our clients wearing masks. You know, let's see for four weeks whether we say to them, you cannot come in the store without a mask, whether we have a riot outside. I don't know. So we've needed to learn what it's like to kind of, we need our hygiene in place, right? We need all these things. And so we're only going to two chairs next week, you know, for the first four weeks. Look, you're the perfect example. You have built an iconic brand. I know sometimes it doesn't feel that way when you're in the thick of it. But you say hint water to anybody and they know. So I'll let you sink, sink, have that sink in. It's an iconic brand. It's 15 years. Iconic brands don't get built in five minutes. No, it's true. They get built because you took the care to build them brick by brick by brick. And sometimes, you know, you lay 20 and 18 fall down. Sometimes you lay 20 and you get lucky and only three fall down. Right. And so, you know, for us, what I would tell everybody is breathe. There will be life on the other side. Don't make harsh decisions. Have plenty of cash to last it out. And I suspect if most people took a 10% sort of rule, they could stop doing 10% of the things they're doing and it would only get better. Smaller groups do better together. Yeah. I'm convinced of that. I think that's I think that's so true. I mean, I have my own sort of, you know, I'll remember this time really well. I was in New York actually the week of March 9th. Mm. And well. Wow my book is coming out in, in October. And I was shooting the cover for my book with this photographer. And I was like, I've got to get it done. I'm, I'm going to screw up the deadlines. And so it was on March 13th. And I kept thinking it was Friday, March 13th. And I kept thinking that he was going to cancel on me. And uh, I called him the day before. And I said, Hey, are you going to cancel? And he said, you know, no, 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 we're going to do it. And then I'm going to get out of town because New York was really, you yeah, totally. Yeah. It was interesting. And I remember going back to my office, you know, I, there was just a different feeling in the office than what was in San Francisco. And I was like, Hey, what's going on? And, you know, somebody said to me, and we have about 15 people that work in our office in New York. And one of the guys that works in supply chain said, you know, I'm just a little nervous. Like I'm on the subway. I love my job. I, I love coming here, but you know, I'm starting to really feel like I'm making kind of, I'm not sure I'm making the right decisions to actually get here to work. And I'm like, totally like, you know, is it about hint? No, no, no. Love it here. It's all great. And so we made the decision on March 12th to actually shut down our office Mm -hmm. in New York before anything else. And I had to explain it to people in San Francisco, what I was Mm -hmm. feeling. I was saying like, it's just different out here. And I can't even give you the visual. I remember going to my local diner right next door and Bloomberg was in there and he was like almost like one of the only people in the diner you know he was just sitting there and and, you know I mean it was just weird that like no one was there and 
Anyway, you know, I remember coming back, going into a Target store. My, one of my kids said, hey, can you stop at Target on the way home from the airport on March 13th? And, and I walked in and our shelves were bare in Target. And the auto replenishment system wasn't working properly and they were out of stock on our product. And so I called our head of sales and he's like, I don't know. I mean, it's this, you know, auto replenishment. I, I don't know what to say. I went into Molly Stones and Whole Foods, a few other stores, same thing. Like we were like almost yep. out of stock. And so I went into overdrive that weekend and I have not really been involved in sort of the day-to-day like sales of Hint in a few years. And I went into overdrive trying to figure out like not only what my customer was doing, they were loading up and I could see it, whether they shopped at Target or Whole Foods or any of these other stores. But I also was thinking about how stressful this was for our buyers Right. And how they were out and like, how annoying would it be for me as a supplier to go to them and say, "Uh, can you fix this problem about getting our product in stock? You know, like, obviously that was a huge issue, but I said, instead, can I just send a truckload in on Monday morning and we'll figure out the invoicing later, but I just want to fix this problem. And so that was like that, that weekend for us. And obviously we're an essential product. So, you know, we, have sort of other things that we have to do in order to be an essential product. And we use fruit in our product too. So we're regulated by the FDA and et cetera, et cetera. So that was a whole, like we had done just a lot of things right, you know, in terms of we don't have any people in the actual bottling facility when we're, our products are getting filled and all these things. So we had done a lot of things right there. But then I came back to the people in, in San Francisco and we started thinking, you know, okay, is it actually safe for our teams to go out and be in these stores? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's when like my scrappiness and I heard a lot of that in you too, where it was just like, I was just thinking, you know, I was putting myself back in their shoes. Not that I didn't normally do that, but I mean, I was really willing and, and through this whole thing, I've been, you know, helping out the sales team in Marin County and, and jumping Mm -hmm. in. But I think it's, um, it's really, those are the entrepreneurs that ultimately don't forget how to actually do every single totally. job, which is what I think you, you know, you very clearly in your description, were describing that as well. Yeah. We make our hair color in the Lombardy region of Italy. So we had to get pretty scrappy. It's been an interesting thing and it's almost like muscle memory. Yeah. Right. It just comes back to you. Or is that just- that's crazy. So this year, so what is what are you thinking about moving forward? I mean, what is sort of the the exciting thing for Madison Reed and and for Amy this year? Well, lots of different things. You'll see an, a number of new stores. So we'll open with twenty. We closed with twelve. You'll see us introducing a new set of products that are different and meaning all in hair color, but some different products and. You know, the the company doubled. And so we're now in kind of a very different stage of profitability and, you know, massive growth and and investing in infrastructure now. Because as I say to everybody, one cannot know what you don't have until it's too late to know you didn't have it. Yeah. So we're, you know, supply chain and bringing a factory to the U.S. and blah, blah, blah. So lots of fun stuff. Look, I'm, you know, I'm blessed. And so... You know, I'm very grateful. I'm humbled by how, you know, this has been for a lot of people, our team members, you know, and we've, thank goodness, no one has gotten sick, but the anxiety of kids at home and kids, you know, trying to go to school and people managing time. I mean, it's like unprecedented. I'm excited to get back to life, although I think life's going to be different for a while. But, you know, the, the core issue is that, you know, love always wins. The core issue is that taking care of our customers is always the core pinnacle thing. And if you take care of your team members, the rest works out. So, you know, we're just a little, we're just two X bigger, but the same humble folks just trying to get some hair color to people. I love it. So on a different topic, favorite flavor of hint? Pineapple. Pineapple. Oh, I love the pineapple too. It's, It's awesome. And what makes you unstoppable? The question of the hour. (laughs) <laughs> I am I am not flexible 
I am resilient and agile. I love it. I love it. It's, it's awesome. So where do people find you, Amy? Obviously, madisonreed.com, but also on social. Their social is just super easy. It's at Amy Errett. So one word, Amy Errett, capital A. And you can just find me on Facebook, social. I have a, a public email, which is aje at madison-reed.com. I always welcome feedback from customers. That's how we stay on top of our game. So I love it. keep it coming. I love it. Love it. So take care. Thank you so Thank much you, you for coming on. And I, I love it. Love it. And Madison Reed and Amy Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. Bye. Okay. Love you. Take you care. You have a great Bye. afternoon. Okay. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye. If you like what you heard, please help spread the word and leave us a review. You can also follow along with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Kara Golden. Do you have a question for me or want to nominate an innovator to Spotlight? Please talk to me at Kara Golden on Twitter. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, be unstoppable. Unstoppable. unstoppable.